Mr. President, I rise today to offer a tribute to honor Robert W. Bogle in the Philadelphia Tribune newspaper. Bob Bogle's family and many of his friends are with us here in Washington, D.C., who have traveled from Philadelphia and other parts of our state and beyond to be with us. And as we pay tribute to his leadership and his commitment and to the Philadelphia African American community and to all the people of the city of Philadelphia in southeastern Pennsylvania, I rise as well to honor the role that the Philadelphia Tribune, as a leader in the black press, has played in communities in Pennsylvania uh, and throughout our state. This is the fifth year which I've come to the floor of the United States Senate to honor a prominent African-American Pennsylvanian as part of the celebration of Black History Month. Bob Bogle today joins the Reverend Leon Sullivan, Judge Leon Higginbotham, former Transportation Secretary Bill Coleman, and former Pennsylvania Secretary of the Commonwealth C. Dolores Tucker uh, in being recognized this month in this way. But today we talk about Bob Bogle and the Philadelphia Tribune and in a larger sense the history and the future of the black press in Pennsylvania and across the country. But from the time that Bob was a young child, his life has been inseparable from the Philadelphia Tribune. Bob's father, John Bogle, was the advertising director at the Philadelphia Tribune, and Bob still reminisces about the playground that he lived in, which was much different than the playground that most children live in. As early as the age of seven, Bob would roam the Tribune building while waiting for his father to finish work. Bertha Godfrey, employed by the Tribune since 1946 and now a senior vice president, recalls a young Bob, Bob Bogle wandering around curiously observing the production department and other areas of the production of the Philadelphia Tribune newspaper. In 1970, Bob Bogle started selling advertising for the Tribune and quickly worked his way up, impressing his colleagues and business associates alike. In 1973, he became advertising director, 1976, director of marketing, and by 1983, executive vice president and treasurer before becoming president and chief executive officer of the Tribune in 1989. Despite his early exposure to the Tribune, Bob did not initially plan on a career in journalism. He attended Cheney State College, now by the name of Cheney University, to study soci sociology, and he earned a BA in urban studies. After that, and after it became clear that he was going to play a role in the management of the Tribune, he also attended the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School to study marketing and economics. He's completed courses of study at Temple, University and the Rochester Institute of Technology and continues to this day to hone his newspaper expertise by participating in annual workshops in many areas of, of uh, marketing and advertising and publishing. Now, Bob has become a role model for Philadelphia African Americans and for the community at large. And he served in leadership roles in a wide range of professional, civic, and social organizations. In the interest of time, I won't read those but I'll make sure that they all get in the record. Bob's also been honored for his service and his leadership. In 2002, President George W. Bush appointed him to serve as a member of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, that commission uh, in place at that time that he was named to. In the year 2000, he received an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Drexel University in Philadelphia. In addition, Bob has been a member of so many other uh, organizations, too numerous to name. While he's recognized as a community leader in various realms, it is Bob's role at the Tribune and with the black press movement that stands out uh, as his life's work. Today, few would question that the right, uh, few would question that the right to free press as enshrined in the Bill of Rights applies to all. The right ensures that all Americans can participate in a vigorous and healthy debate necessary for a well-functioning democracy. But when our Constitution was first ratified, as we recall, most African Americans were not recognized as citizens and had few, if any, opportunities for participation 
in our democracy. It was not until a group of courageous men living in New York gathered some 30 years after the ratification of the Constitution that African Americans finally found an institution where they could, quote, uh, plead their own case, unquote, as they said at the time. In 1827, editors John Brown Rossworm and Samuel Eliot Cornish pub published Freedom's Journal, the first black newspaper in America. The newspaper pr provided African Americans with a public square of their own where they could participate in their own discussions and advocate for African Americans. As these two distinguished leaders wrote in their first editorial, quote, too long have others spoken for us, too long has the public been deceived by misrepresentations, unquote. While the Freedom's Journal was short-lived, it began what was no less than a revolution. Other black newspapers arose and began to ex explore subjects that were previously off limits in the press of the day. New black newspapers delved into previously unmentionable hardships in crafting a new identity for freed and enslaved African Americans. Topics such as slavery and, and menial labor were examined by African Americans for African Americans. For the first time in the history of our country, African Americans were able to speak freely through a press of their own. In addition, African Americans could start announcing to the world some of the, their most precious moments in life, like, like births and anniversaries and deaths and other family news. The black press helped establish a new extended community of African Americans all across the United States of America. The black press expanded in the years prior to the Civil War as over 40 publications across the nation provided African Americans with viewpoints on issues such as emigration to Africa, emancipation in the South of the United States, and of course, of course, abolition and freedom. Frederick Douglass was one of the many who published a black newspaper in which he, like many others, urged African American men in the North to enlist in the Union, Union Army. The post-Civil War era saw a period of rapid growth for the black press. The first daily newspaper, the New Orleans Tribune, was published in 1864, and newspapers continued to open across the country as African Americans migrated uh, from the South. By the 1880s, it became obvious that the growing African American population in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, needed a newspaper. Christopher J. Perry filled the void. Following graduation from high school, Mr. Perry moved to Philadelphia to start a newspaper because he said, and I quote, for my people to make progress, they must have a newspaper in which they can speak and speak out against injustice, unquote. Mr. Perry's newspaper, the Philadelphia Tribune, often told a different story from a perspective other than that of the city's traditional newspapers. Mr. Perry and the Philadelphia Tribune quickly established themselves as leaders of the growing African-American community in Philadelphia. The Tribune published stories highlighting black institutions across Philadelphia that were not reported by the mainstream papers. Mr. Perry championed the causes of the African-American community, from covering important events to offering articles about champions of social and racial equality. Additionally, he provided a forum for African-Americans to report on job openings, musical performances, and other happenings uh, within the African-American society. After Mr. Perry passed away in May of 1921, his children continued the traditions he began in the pages of the Philadelphia Tribune. The second generation of Perrys continued to fight for the equality of African-Americans. Eugene Washington Rhodes, Mr. Perry's son-in-law, succeeded him as editor. As Dorothy Anderson wrote in a Tribune, in a tribute, I should say, in 1958, quote, in no year since the Philadelphia Tribune first burst upon the Philadelphia scene was there a single edition which did not press for equal rights, equal opportunities, and equal privileges, uh, unquote, for the African-American community. Eugene Rhodes continued to spotlight social issues around the city of Philadelphia and around the country by focusing on the northern migration during the 1920s and dangerous housing conditions 
for African Americans in Philadelphia during the 1930s. In addition, he provided a much needed, or much needed, I should say, support for some of the first African American politicians in the city of Philadelphia, such as John Asbury and Andrew Stevens, the first African Americans elected to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Perhaps most importantly, the Tribune led the fight against segregation in, in the Philadelphia School District by creating its own legal defense fund and publishing many editorials championing uh, the equality of African Americans. In 1940, the publisher of the Chicago Defender called a meeting of the major publications which made up the black press. He proposed that newspapers, from, uh, newspapers form an advocacy group to ensure the, the long-term survival of the black press. The Philadelphia Tri Tribune was one of the newspapers invited to take part, and out of this first conference grew the National Newspaper Publishers Association. Over 200 newspapers are members today, and the association provides vital services to the black press so that its members can continue to report on, African -American, on the African American society and community. As the current president and CEO of the Philadelphia Tribune, Bob Bogle has continued the traditions of Christopher Perry while leading the African American community of Philadelphia into and beyond the 21st century. The Philadelphia Tribune is now the, lar the longest operating African American newspaper in the nation. Recognizing Bob's leadership, the National Newspaper Publishers Association has honored the Tribune five times with the, the Russ Worm Award, the association's highest honor for, quote, best newspaper in America, unquote. The, the award is named for John B. Russworm, co-founder of, as I mentioned before, Freedom's Journal in the 1800s. Recognizing as a leading, a recognized, I should say, as a leading member of the black press, Bob Bogle has served two terms as president of the National Newspaper Publishers Association and is credited with increasing awareness of African American issues, values, and lifestyles. He is also a founding member and president of the African American News and Information Consortium, a group of premier black newspapers in some of the largest markets in the United States of America. Finally, Bob continues in his role as ambassador for the city of Philadelphia. He sees race as a leading, uh, a leading issue, still plaguing our nation. But he remains relentlessly optimistic. I'm quoting Bob here. I'm deeply engaged in the community. I believe that Philadelphia as the birthplace of America, is the best city in America. It's diverse, it has great size, and our success will come from our collective understanding of who we are. The Philadelphia Tribune, though it is dedicated to covering the black community, also honors diversity, and we have non-African Americans in every area of our business, unquote. I'm quoting Bob there. And of course, Bob has been not just a leader in the African-American community, but a leader in the Philadelphia community at large. For many years, and especially active in the advancement of young African-Americans who live in Philadelphia and the region. He describes his essential philosophy this way, and I quote, to be responsible for what you do and be the best at it. We need to account for what we do. Accountability means responsibility and taking pride in your work and doing the best you can, unquote. So says Bob Bogle, and these are good words to live by. They're words we can take to heart and strive every day in our own lives uh, to live by. I am so honored to be able to offer this tribute today to Bob Bogle, to his team at the Philadelphia Tribune, and to, a lar in a larger sense, the history, and most importantly, the future of the African-American press, so-called the black press, in the United States of America. So please join me today in honoring a man of strength, a man of character, accomplishment, and service, Robert W. Bogle of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania.